USS Ranger was, in just about every metric you can think of, a compromised design. One intended to test if small carriers were the way of the future, and one with multiple choices in her design, that, even past that general idea, were a bit ill-advised. A ship that was so harmed by her choices that she didn't even get sent to the Pacific at the absolute worst times of World War II. A ship that, in spite of all of this, still gave long and useful service. If Ranger was a flawed design, hobbled by treaty and inexperience, she was still one that proved well worth the time and money spent on building her. As usual for my videos, a bit of background before we get into her service history. The Washington Naval Conference and Attendant Treaty had set a firm limit on tonnage for aircraft carriers, though at the time this was seen as secondary to limiting battleships and battle cruisers. Even so, with the limitations, the United States Navy had 70,000 tons left for carriers after the completion of the pair of Lexingtons. This left the Navy with a bit of a conundrum. They had yet to test the new conversions, and didn't yet know if big carriers or smaller carriers were better in a combat scenario. Moreover, the Lexingtons were already a special case as it was, and the largest any purpose-built treaty carrier could get was 27,000 tons. With this in mind, and knowing they had limited tonnage to begin with, the options were pretty obvious even at the time. A couple relatively large carriers, 23,000-ish tons, though still smaller than the conversions, or five small carriers of around 14,000 tons, and potentially a middle ground of four carriers between the two at about 17,000 tons, but that would be even more of a compromise, so it was never looked at particularly seriously. Without the benefit of hindsight or of testing the different options, the Navy was looking towards the option that gave the most flight decks out of a belief that redundancy in numbers was worth more than the size of the carrier. There was also a certain prevailing belief that, since you couldn't armor the flight deck anyway without unacceptable limits on carrying capacity, see the problems the British armored carriers had here, then wasting a bunch of tonnage on a ship that would be mission killed easily no matter what you did, well, why waste tonnage on losing plane capacity and speed if you're just going to get mission killed anyway? As such, the Navy was really interested in the smaller ships, at least when the decision was made to produce a small carrier as a test bed to go alongside the larger battlecruiser conversions. You can see this same sort of do we build big or small thing come up when WASP is being designed. Because a general thing to remember is the USN will always put priority on redundancy and having as many planes as humanly possible. This typically means more carriers, even if, at this point in history anyway, that meant smaller carriers. Even if, as a result, you got ships that had basically no armor. But I digress. This is also the time period where the only foreign carriers are either conversions akin to if far less capable than the Lexingtons, or Hermes and Hosho. While both of those are purpose-built small carriers, they're also much smaller than even the smallest USN design being proposed. And there's no real way to judge them other than by observing them. So without being able to rely on foreign observations, and with only Langley on hand to test carriers... Well, we come back around to that 13,800 ton design. The Navy decided on that one because it would get more planes for the same tonnage compared to a smaller number of the larger designs. Let's see how that worked out for them, shall we? With the decision to go for the smallest feasible design, the Navy ended up with a ship riddled with compromises. They did succeed in their goal to carry the most possible planes, since her large for her size hangar allowed Ranger to carry between 70 to 90 planes in spite of her small size. This depending on the exact period and planes you're looking at, of course. The problem is, in getting that large air wing, Ranger had multiple sacrifices she had to pay. An obvious one is speed. Ranger could, again akin to the later Wasp, manage about 29 knots on a good day, with her 53,000 shaft horsepower on two screws. When compared to Langley and the speed of the battle fleet, this isn't terrible, 
It would have created issues operating with a much larger Lexington's in a combat situation, however. Though at least Ranger never actually had to do that. While we're on the topic of the conversions, Ranger also lacked their heavy anti-surface battery. Or, for that matter, any anti-surface battery. Ranger's eight 5-inch guns were intended entirely for anti-aircraft work, not for fighting off cruisers or destroyers. Which is honestly a bit forward-thinking, as were the 40 50 caliber machine guns she carried, if only as they showed the way forward to the swarm of 20mm cannon that would begin dotting American ships later on. One less forward-thinking concept that kept cropping up every time the pilots got too much say on carrier design was the fact that Ranger was originally intended to be a flush deck carrier. I can't blame them too much here, since the Lexingtons had yet to enter service when this choice was made. That being said, as lessons from those ships came filtering through, Ranger would be changed to have a small island literally tacked onto her side. Seriously, look at it sometime, especially where it meets the hull, and tell me that doesn't look like something they just tacked on as an afterthought. It's also why she has those unique tilting funnels at her stern, because when she was a flush decker, that was where they chose to put her funnels to vent exhaust fumes. While she was early enough in construction to get an island superstructure, it was still far and away too late to change her propulsion layout. So she kept those tilting funnels, raised for normal operations, and lowered to clear space and fumes for flight operations. The final two sacrifices she made consisted of her lack of torpedo storage, or torpedo bombers, and her functionally non-existent armor. The former was largely because of weight savings, and this being the age of the dive bomber. I'm not joking, for a bit there the Navy had basically no torpedo bombers at all. So why bother with putting the weights into torpedo storage? I'm sure that won't be a problem later on. As for the armor, Ranger had a 2-inch, here for moral support, belt that might do some good against destroyers, maybe. Along with an even thinner 1-inch deck over her steering gear, that is basically the same, but for bombs instead of gunfire. You can really see how little the Navy considered survivability to be important for this ship. Even her flight deck was incredibly lightly built, which made it easy to repair, but also easy to damage. She also carried some interesting outriggers to get more plane space on her flight deck. These look about as questionably safe as you'd expect, somewhat akin to Wasp's deck edge elevator. Even with all these sacrifices though, Ranger would still come out overweight, largely because of her late edition island with her standard displacement rising from the intended 13,800 tons to more like 14,500 tons. Still pretty small and light, but heavier than intended, with all the stability issues that implies. Ranger very much did not like heavy seas. Laid down on September 26, 1931, launched on February 25th of 1933, and commissioned on June 4th, 1934, Ranger would enter service in quite a different layout from her original design. A classic example of changing design priorities while under construction, and a sign of things to come in regards to the argument between more small carriers and fewer but more capable large ones. Ranger would fuel a fair chunk of this debate, as her entire pre-war service can be summed up as directly compared to the Lexingtons and found wanting. While Ranger could, indeed, operate similar air wings to her larger counterparts, the amount of sacrifices inherent to her design became pretty quickly apparent. This isn't to say Ranger didn't give good or valuable service. Her duties and training and the like were just as important and valuable as the Lexington's, and she served very well in this role, though as war clouds began to gather across the world, she went in for heavy modernization at various points gaining radar and larger planes, along with the ability to carry torpedo bombers. Her machine guns were gradually phased out as well, in favor of 1.1-inch cannon, and later 20mm cannon and 40mm bofors as well. The actual arrival of the war would find a modernized Ranger on the East Coast, and here she would remain as the one fleet carrier to serve her entire combat service in the Atlantic. This fact goes a long way towards showing how the Navy felt about her chances of surviving a battle with the Japanese. I find it rather telling that, while the similarly compromised Wasp was considered at least 
capable enough to send to the Pacific, Ranger would never be sent, at least to fight against the Japanese. Not even when the Navy was down to Enterprise and Saratoga trading places as the one carrier standing against Japan. The Navy was so resistant to sending Ranger into the Pacific that they would sooner pawn HMS Victorious off the British instead. With the Pacific off-limits, Ranger would instead be the go-to carrier for the Atlantic fleet. In this, she would do similar roles to Wasp, insofar as her most common task in the early war was ferrying around army fighters. Ranger would make several trips to Africa, flying off a couple hundred P-40s of various models, about 60 to 70 at a time, which is most of her practical air wing, but other than this, she would mostly serve training roles and the odd convoy escort. At least until November 1942, at which point she got to do actual, proper combat service. Leading a squadron of four escort carriers, Ranger would be the primary air support for the Operation Torch landings in French Morocco. In the case of these landings, her aircraft would duel with fishy French planes, and her pilots would bombard targets ashore, as well as French warships in and around Casablanca's harbor. Among other things, Ranger's pilots would hit a cruiser, a destroyer, and maybe a couple submarines. The big ticket target, though, was the incomplete John Bart. This battleship, with only her four turret fitted, had been switching between bombarding the landings and dueling with the much more capable USS Massachusetts in one of the decidedly stranger battleship duels in history. Ranger's pilots would put an end to this, dive bombing the French battleship and putting some seriously big holes into her. Over the course of the invasion, three days, Ranger would launch just shy of 500 combat sorties, showing that, regardless of her design flaws, she was still a fully capable combatant. She would only lose 16 aircraft in exchange for wrecking the Vichy naval forces and destroying something like 80 planes between ground strikes and dogfights. With the surrender of Casablanca, Ranger would return to her old training and ferrying duties, however. At least for a little bit. Funnily enough, during these training and ferrying duties in April of 1943, the Germans did the same thing they did with Wasp the previous year. Trumpeted about how they had, by submarine, sunk the Ranger, to the point of the commander of the U-boat in question being personally decorated for it. There's a certain level of irony here in that both of the carriers that were very vulnerable to submarine attack got falsely claimed by the Germans. Seriously, when you look at their service careers, the amount of times Ranger and Wasp are con coinciding here is kind of hilarious. At any rate, Ranger would spend the end of 1943 serving with the Royal Navy and bombing various targets in Norway. She didn't get the chance to take a swing at Tirpitz, however, before that service ended in 1944. When she returned to the States, Ranger was quickly taken off the line and converted to a training carrier. Frankly speaking, there were just too many other carriers to go around at this point, with even more Essexes and lighter carriers arriving every day, so there was no real point in risking Ranger. Her utility as a training carrier outweighed whatever combat value she still had in the face of Germany's impending defeat and the surplus of other holes to serve in the Pacific. She spent time doing this and various ferry duties, since she was still fully capable in that role, before getting refit again in spring. That refit, among other things, would strengthen her flight deck and prepare her for a more specialized training role, night fighter training. It was, in this new guise, that Ranger would finally be allowed into the Pacific, if only for training duties around Hawaii. It was there she would spend most of the remainder of the war, before going back to the West Coast for more usual training than that specialized role. It was here that Ranger would be when the war ended, and the Navy was left with a training carrier that had taken no damage in the war, and was, for all intents and purposes, still fully functional. Maybe a bit worn down by constant service, but no worse for wear than any other ship that served through the entire war. Probably a bit better off, actually. So what to do with her, then? Well, clearly she was never going to go back to frontline service. There were enough Essexes and Independences and Midways and other such things that Ranger was just plain surplus to requirements. She could continue in a training role, 
But again, you have enough carriers for that. You don't really need to keep an old, slow, and small one around for, well, anything at this point. So it should be little surprise that the Navy decided to scrap Ranger as surplus to their needs. Decommissioned in late 1946, the first purpose-built American carrier would go to the Scrapper's Torch in early 1947. Though, before I end the video, and this is something I can't 100% confirm, keep that in mind, but John Fry writes in the excellent, seriously, pick this thing up if you have any interest in Saratoga, USS Saratoga CV-3, that Ranger was originally intended for Crossroads, and Sarah was substituted for her at the last minute. Is this true? I don't know personally. But it is an interesting counterfactual to imagine it being Ranger at the bottom of Bikini Atoll instead of Saratoga. That detour aside, though, Ranger was a ship that was filled with compromises from the outset. But she survived the war, largely through avoiding heavy combat, I grant you, and gave good service when allowed the chance to show what she could do. That's the most anyone can ask of any ship and her crew, I think. Once again, I know my videos are longer than the average for this kind of content. I just feel that I need to actually show why certain decisions are made, and talk about the service history and why it went the way it did. That makes these longer. That and I don't feel the stereotypical 5 minute guide format is for me anyway, other than the HSS videos. To those who still enjoy the content, thank you. It does help to see my style received well. Remember to like and subscribe, and I'll see you in the next one.